Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. Today's topic, ClearPath MCP Release 18.0. Let's get started. Our first speaker for you today is Larry Obey, Product Manager for ClearPath MCP. And with that, Larry, the audience is yours. Uh, thank you, Matt. I'd like to all, welcome all of you to this webinar on ClearPath MCP Release 18.0. I'm going to be joined today by two of our lead engineers, uh, Kung Lin and Tim Case, who are going to go into some more details about some of the key features in MCP 18.0. Before we get started with MCP 18.0, I'd like to spend a few minutes giving you an overview of our ClearPath Forward strategy, which is focused around your applications. So for a number of years, we've offered um, Libra servers that provide an optimized infrastructure for supporting your MCP-based applications. And now they're all Intel-based. A few years ago, we uh, took the MCP software and combined it with the firmware that allows the MCP to run on Intel servers and created a new set of products called the ClearPath Software Series, which is a software-only offering that you can run on the hardware of your choice. And you can run it either on bare metal, um, VMware, or Microsoft's Hyper-V. We've got a series of products in this area, for primarily for entry level right now. We also have a developer studio that handles uh, development environments. And we've got new products planned uh, coming down the road. Over the next couple of years, we're going to be taking this software series to the next level and uh, creating a set of products for the ClearPath Forward Hybrid Cloud. And this will allow you to run the ClearPath software in either a private cloud or in a public cloud. Uh, so we want to offer you a choice of, of options for, for where you can deploy your ClearPath MCP applications. The next element of our forward, ClearPath Forward software strategy is where we're focusing our investments in software. So the first is the infrastructure offerings that I just discussed. Uh, we want to give you the option to deploy your MCP-based applications on industry standard IT infrastructure consisting of hardware uh, of your choice. We also want to give you the flexibility to put it into clouds. So this allows you to avoid the, the use of dedicated hardware by leveraging virtualization technologies. It also gives you the options to deploy your applications on-premises, off-premises, or maybe a combination of the, of the two, uh, depending on your business requirements. Another big issue for, for everybody right now is security, because we're all trying to stay ahead of the hackers. And this is resulting in the standards and best practices in our industry to evolving continuously. And some of the changes that, that come up uh, need to be implemented very quickly because uh, to protect your sensitive data and, and private data from uh, unauthorized access and tampering. The third area where we're focusing is on helping you scale your applications up to support business growth. Uh, sometimes, though, when, when trying to scale up an application, we run into some constraints, such as performance of, of any kind of uh, portions of our system, or limits, such as tables and field sizes in various software products. And one of the things we're trying to do is, is make sure that these things don't prevent uh, your applications from scaling up and, and growing your business. The fourth and final area that's getting a lot of attention these days is integration and interoperability. And this is being driven by several things. Uh, everybody, your, your clients, your partners, your employees, wants to be able to use mobile devices, their phones and their tablets, to be able to access applications and data uh, from anywhere at any time on a 24 by 7 basis. Another driver of integration and interoperability is uh, organizations, organizations having initiatives to develop uh, digital channels to make it easier for clients and partners to do business with, with, with an organization. Regulatory compliance is another driver. Often to comply with uh, requirements of a regulator, you have to be able to collect data from multiple data sources, multiple databases and applications that are running on different types of systems. And so this is uh, creating a need for new products that uh, to facilitate uh, that type of activity. This is the MCP release schedule. Uh, we've formerly were doing our, our MCP releases every year, uh, but between MCP 17.0 and MCP 18.0, we've switched to a two-year cycle, which we think will make it easier for you to uh, manage and, and plan for, for upgrading from one release to the next. So MCP release 18.0 will uh, become available at the end of this month. 
uh, later this week, and it will be supported for five years until April of 2022. Now, one thing I want to draw your attention to is MCP 16 If you're still running on it, uh, support will end uh, at the end of October of this year. That's, a, that's six months from now. And so now is the time to start planning to move up to something more current. And we're starting to plan the next MCP release, which will be called MCP 19.0, and we're currently planning to release that in about two years, in the second quarter of uh, 2019. Now we'll start turning to the, the feature content in um, MCP uh, 18.0. And uh, I'd like to turn it, we're first going to talk about security. And so now I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, Kung Lin. We'll discuss uh, the major security feature at MCP 18.0. Kung? Uh, yes, thank you, Larry. The, uh, my topic is the uh, database encryption. And the, uh, what is database encryption? Database encryption is a new optional separated price software product introduced on 18.0. It is designed for the payment card industry compliance. And uh, many times it's referred to as field level encryption. Uh, for the DMS2, it is item-level encryption. Uh, what is useful is to protect your individual items. For example, if you have a social security number, driver license, or some private information need to be protected, and you can select it in the DMS2 database to make those fields to be encrypted. And it is different from the sensitive data uh, structure option. The sensitive data structure option is to protect the data to be accessed outside DMS2, but this is the data in the DMS2 protections. And if you have any need to comply with the regulatory uh, appliance, uh, compliance and to protect the data, and you should consider to use the uh, database encryption or we normally refer to as field level encryption or item level encryption. And before we talk about this encryption, um, your management, your peer, or when you talk to anyone, they might ask why you want to use the database encryption instead of a storage encryption. Okay. And then I come up with the uh, very uh, simple three comparison. Uh, to, uh, to talk about database encryption is much better than the storage encryption. Number one, the key management. On a system, you can have multiple databases, but if you use the storage uh, encryption, you have no control of the key. Uh, with the database encryption, every single database, you have control of the key. Additionally, with our unique implementation, Every structure got its own unique key, not just the database. Okay, I'll go over that later in my presentation. And then, secondary, it can also protect the insider, internal hacker. Because if you use the storage encryption, any person who has authority to access the storage, when they read the data, it will be decrypted. But if you use the database encryption, whoever try to read a file still get encrypted data. A typical example is when you run this popular MCP system utility called Dumpo. When you run Dumpo to list the file, you'll be able to see all the data encrypted. Okay, so this can protect, okay, not only external hacker as well as internal hacker. Now, Furthermore, if somebody has accessed the system, okay, and working on another application has totally not related to the database, he said, I have something wrong with my application, I need to take a system dump. Now when you take a system dump, okay, and you will dump everything in memory. Now, all the data in memory from the database is also protected with this unique feature. So basically all the all the sensitive data will be protected not only on the storage as well in the memory as well. So we can also protect not only the external but also the internal intruder to access the data. Okay. 
And now, when we talk about this, how you deploy these, okay, and we make it very simple. We make it very transparent to the application. You can do it for a new database. We know that it's very easy. You turn on the option since no, there's no data there. But for the existing production database, what we make it, the user experience is exactly the same as reorganization. Okay, I'm sure all of you has performed schema change for your DMS2 database hundreds of times over the years. And the, uh, to enable this feature is nothing but to add some syntax in the desktop source and follow the reorganization process. And of course, there's a restriction. You have to recompile the program because the record size is changed, okay? On the next slide, I will go over why the record size is changed. And furthermore, the, this is the, uh, the second time we have done this in the DMS2 product to seamlessly integrate it with firmware. The one we have done in the past, I do not know how many of you have used it. It is called data compression, okay? Now, when you, when you go on the system support FCW, I strongly recommend you to try the data compression. And if you like it, okay, let us know. Because during our test, it is a super, performance, not only the storage of your backup much smaller, but also the performance much, much faster, okay? And this is the, uh, the direction we are going. And the database encryption, we have seamlessly integrated with the firmware. Now, how do we get it done? As I explained earlier, we want to manage the user experience, user experience like you did for the desktop source. Okay, you, you pick and choose whatever the item you want to encrypt it. You can encrypt the alpha, numeric, real, group items. Now, we are so about a field item, boolean item, we decided not to support those because every encrypted item, the size need to be multiple of 16 bytes plus 20, 30 bytes for the padding. And this is for the AES GCM algorithm. Okay. Now, we, as you can see, we support two algorithms, but we strongly recommend you use AESTCM because this is the most popular one now available in the market. But why we implement the second one? Because we don't know when the AESTCM will get compromised. Now, it's not right, not now, right now, but we just don't know when. But we do prepare for this. In case AESTCM gets compromised, you can switch to AES HMAC. Meanwhile, during this period, Unisys can implement a new algorithm. Okay, that's why we introduced two algorithms, but we do recommend you use AES GCM. Now, how you set the database encryption in your desktop source is all the standard operation that you do an item options, okay? You can choose the I specific item, you can choose the data set level option, you can choose the database option, but we recommend you to do it at an item level option because due to the storage consideration and there is some overhead. As I mentioned that every encrypted item, the size will be multiple of 16 bytes plus 30 bytes for padding. You may wonder, what if I got three real numbers Suppose to only take 348 bits, three words of data. Right now, each one of them will become 16 plus 30 or 46 bytes of data. Boy, my data set record will be huge. Do not worry. The MS2 has a unique optimization. What we have done is we move all the encrypted items to the end of a record, okay? And we adjust this internal item offset in our system software, from the user's perspective, it's all the same, okay? There's no difference, okay? And your, your overhead is going to be whatever the total size of the encrypted item uh, plus the worst case, extra 15 bytes and the 30 bytes. So your total wasted space will no more than 40 bytes of data. And then we talk about the key management. 
our key management, our implementation is very unique. As I said earlier, we do not just provide one key. We provide something we call key sets. And we start with 16 keys, and we do a long robin. Every data set, if it has an encrypted item, we will just use one of the 16 keys we use a long robin. Now, in the future, if 16 is not sufficient, we need 256, we need 512, we need 1023, those are easily to be uh, uh, enhanced. Uh, additionally, even though we change those, the only thing need to be done is another reorganization. So as, as I mentioned earlier, the reorganization is required. Why is required? Because the encryption algorithm require the data size to be different. Not the user declared data size, but the encrypted data size. So the record size gets changed from the DMS2 perspective. That is, we need to do a reorganization. And unfortunately, the user program need to be recompiled. But this is no different. You add, change, or delete any item in your data set. Okay. So let me do a brief summary about our implementation. It is all transparent. Get your data source, select the item you want to encrypt, and run reorganization, and your data will be encrypted. And you can run system dump to see it. And when you run DMUT to DC, you're also going to see your encrypted data. And then, what product can be used for these features? All the DMS2 software has been enhanced to support this. However, the data access product, 4GL product, or ETL product, like data exchange and data, uh, data bridge, are not supported. Because when we encrypt the data, we also encrypt the audit. So when you, when you copy the audit, all the audit files will contain encrypted data. And that's why data exchange and data bridge are not supported. And the, uh, for the 4GL, they are not supported. For all the DMS2 software, they are supported, including DM inquiry and ergo. Now, the next two slides, I will give a brief introduction of the architectural diagram of this feature. What we do is we have uh, add a new component called key manager. Now, at this point, I do want to bring up when you want to use this feature, you need to have four different products installed on your system. Of course, this is a DMS2 feature. You need to have a DMS2 product. You also need to have a security center because we use security center to manage our encryption keys. And then you also need to have a security product because it's MC API. We interface with MC API uh, to interface all the various uh, components. And then on the Windows side, okay, you do need to install secure transport. And secure transport is not included in the normal SSR. And it is need to be separated order. Okay. So just remember you need to have a DMS2 security center, security and secure transport product install using the simple install. And the uh, if you need any assistance or you have any questions, please contact the local Unisys people. And this diagram show you during the compile time how we create a key set. The data compiler is enhanced to interface with a security product, MC API support. You will talk to key manager and put all the key to the security center database. Now what we have done is very clever. In the data compiler, if you compile with a syntax or you get a syntax error, we do not create key sets. We only create a key set at the very end when the compilation is syntax free. We are ready to create a description file. Now at a long time, what we do is we have an application, talk to the database, go through the DM support to interface with key manager with a security center database and then ACL will go through the DM support via the MC API support to interface with Microsoft Crypto API. 
Now, when you look at this diagram, that's why I said this, the uh, phone wheel <clears throat> integration is so important because at every program, when you do the encryption over decryption, we don't switch the process. Uh, that means all the encryption and decryption are done on top of the current stack, okay? Even though we are asking in the code outside the MCP box, okay? So it's very important, not, important to know, that's why we have uh, such good performance. Uh, for these features. And finally, what are the availability of these features? For the 43, 63, 83, or FS600, it's available on 18.0, but do require a firmware upgrade. And a firmware upgrade is available on the second half of this year and also same as current software series product. For the future Libra or FS servers, okay, or future software series products, and the uh, database encryption is already ready in the firmware. Now as to the older system, uh, there's no plan to license the database encryption. Okay. And that conclude my the uh, database encryption uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Kung. Okay, I'm going to continue with the uh, other security enhancements that are at MCP uh, 18.0. Okay, another product that's very important for security is a secure shell uh, for Clipboard MCP product. And this is a product that you can use to secure interoperability with other computers uh, using the industry standard SSH uh, protocol suite. So we've enhanced our SSH product and MCP 18.0 in several areas. Uh, we support that some new AC, AES CTR encryption algorithms. We've also qualified it with some additional SSH FTP clients from Tectia and uh, the WS FTP client. There's a, a client SSH client product that's included in the uh, our secure shell uh, capability set, and it is something that you can use to send commands securely to other computers and then receive a response uh, securely. We've enhanced it on MCP 18.0 to allow applications to uh, use the SSH client. So we've defined an API to the, to the client uh, program. And then the client program, once it receives the response back from the other computer, uh, instead of just displaying it, it can deliver the output to a redirected file. So you can um, you know, use that output, let's say, in another program, uh, for example. Client Access Services is a product that's been around since the beginning of ClearPath, and it's used for interoperability between the uh, MCP and Microsoft Windows, and also to share resources between those uh, two operating systems. To help improve security and spotting secure, uh, give security uh, administrators another tool for spotting security issues, we've added some logging capabilities to um, Client Access Services and MCP 18.0. So it can log uh, logins, both successful and not success, unsuccessful uh, situations where somebody enters an incorrect access code or an incorrect charge code. We also will log access violations and individual share accesses. Now you can configure this logging at a system-wide level so that all the shares get logged, or you can configure it so that only individual shares that you're concerned about uh, get logged. Another enhancement to client access services to help with interoperability is the support for the SMB2 protocol suite. And this is focused on ensuring uh, ongoing compatibility with Windows. So uh, we're partnering with Locum to provide the Locum 360 security and compliance uh, tool set. And there's four tools in this set. The first is Locum Safe and Secure which is a centralized security administration tool. And at MCP 18.0, it has a new forgotten password facility. So an end user can request that their MCP password be, be reset. Another new offering is the Admin Desk Basic Edition, which is a, uh, a skinny version of the Admin Desk, which is the um, user interface to safe and secure. And this uh, version of, of Admin Desk basic edition is going to be bundled in all of our operating environment packages. 
The second tool is uh, Safe Survey, which is used for security assessment and identifying risks. And it has several new reports, a software versions report, a client access services report, and a payment card industry uh, compliance report, a PCI compliance report. Local real-time monitor is used for uh, alerting, and the focus on for MCP 18.0 is to simplify configuration of the product. And we've done this by removing the requirement for a separate PC to run the local real-time service, and this has led to the syslog message handling becoming MCP-centric. And finally, there's Locum Secure Audit, which is an audit reporting tool, and it has new reports for port connections and for DMS2 transactions. Some additional products that have been enhanced uh, to help uh, improve security include FTP. Uh, the FTP server has some additional logging capabilities to, uh, again, help the security administrator uh, trace what's going on in the system. The FTP startup file contents can be restricted to prevent end users from overriding the global security settings that have been established by uh, policies and by security uh, administrators. Web Enabler, uh, which is a terminal emulator product, has a single sign-on capability that allows you to use previously entered Windows credentials to log into uh, an MCP server. So this uh, eliminates the need to also enter the MCP user code and password when, when logging into the MCP. Uh, the MCP also has a standard password change library introduced in MCP 18.0. Uh, several years ago, we introduced the concept of hot swap capability to allow uh, products to be updated or replaced on the fly without having to uh, bring down applications. This technology has been extended to the security support library in MCP 18.0. So it can be replaced without having to restart all the message control systems, such as comms, that are linked to it. So we, th we think this can help uh, improve availability of uh, transaction processing applications. And finally, SAN Data Mover has been enhanced so that it can read and write disks that have been encrypted using our MCV disk uh, encryption software product. Okay, the next section of the presentation will focus on application scalability. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Tim Case, who's going to talk to you about a major enhancement in this area on MCP 18.0. Uh, Tim? Thank you, Larry. The uh, main change that we've made for MCP 18 uh, in the networking area is what we call MCP Networking Version 3. Uh, this follows a technology preview that we conducted for this feature last year. MCP Networking Version 3 introduces changes to the MCP networking architecture that greatly improve throughput for TCP IP and BNA connections. You will see a big performance improvement in workloads that stream large amounts of data. We have also implemented an MCP-based tool that simplifies the configuration of TCP IP connections. This tool can be used on M any MCP system that uses MCP networking version 3. The tool allows anyone with a basic understanding of how to configure server networking connections to configure them on an MCP system. In other words, knowledge of the MCP init file syntax or the NAU tool is no longer needed. The use cases that benefit most from MCP networking version 3 include any application which moves large amounts of data across the network. These could be client-written applications or distributed system services such as FTP and BNA file transfer. The performance changes allow your MCP system to make better use of your network infrastructure investments. We were able to obtain these performance improvements by taking advantage of the industry standard hardware that we use in our newer systems. Specifically, we have moved certain compute intensive portions of the networking implementation from the MCP runtime environment to the MCP firmware environment. And in many cases, we were able to offload those to the uh, network interface cards or NICs that uh, are used in the newer systems. 
when we move this this code to the firmware environment or the NICs, it executes much faster and does not consume the MCP MIPS that uh, you were charged for. The 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 uh, principal uh, things that we moved were the calculation of checksums, both for inbound and outbound data. And uh, we also moved the segmentation of large messages into individual packets. So that all occurs outboard now. And as does coalescing of the incoming package, packets back into messages. Your benefit from these changes will depend on the amount of data you are transferring, the number of simultaneous streams of data, and the size of messages that you are sending and receiving. If your application sends small infrequent messages, it is spending very little time in the networking software anyway, and you will not notice a difference. If you often transfer large files across your network, you will see the transfers take place in much less time and consume fewer MIPS while doing so. Applications that exchange small packets in transaction processing fashion will also benefit from somewhat lower message latency. Most of our clients interconnect their BNA networks using BNA over IP. On MCP 18, we enhance the process of negotiating a BNA over IP connection so that to detect when both ends of the connection are systems that are using version 3 networking. When this is detected, then we switch the connection to be set up with our new BNA over TCP. Uh, BNA over TCP connections take full advantage of the changes to the TCP and the elapsed time for native file transfer requests over such a link are substantially re reduced. More specifically, there are two ways to connect hosts in a BNA network. Native links are point-to-point -point connections between hosts. The packets on these connections do not conform to the IP specification, so this needs to be a completely separate uh, network from your IP network. Uh, native BNA links must be fully specified in your initialization file so that the host software can route packets between the systems. Most BNA customers have migrated to using BNA over IP. Configuration of BNA over IP connections is quite a bit simpler, and these packets are routed directly over, routed over your switched IP network. In the past, BNA over IP connections were somewhat slower than native MCP or native BNA connections, but the ability to switch traffic across the network is a great enough advantage that most customers choose to use BNA over IP. From the administrator's point of view, there is no difference between configuring a BNA over IP connection and the new BNA over TCP connection. On this release, the software automatically checks to see if a BNA over TCP can be used. If it can, a TCP is connection is opened. The BNA over TCP connections are superior to the other BNA connections in several ways. Uh, first of all, BNA over TCP connections <coughs> inherit the offloaded uh, implementations of checksums, outbound segmentation, and inbound coalescing. Also, TSP, TCP has better implementations for congestion, congestion management and packet retry for today's high-speed networks, so they, they work a lot better on the higher-speed uh, higher lands. On tests with very large message sizes, we observed TCP and BNA throughput rates up to 10 times higher than on the uh, previous networking release. The performance of native BNA links and of BNA over IP without the uh, TCP augmentation is not changed. If you still have native BNA links, you should strongly consider moving to BNA over IP to obtain the performance advantages you will get when using systems capable of BNA over TCP. Up until the MCP 18 release, the only ways to configure MCP networking were to run the NAU utility and page through a lot of screens to generate the initialization files you need or to start with a sample init file and edit it by hand to describe the network configuration connections available on your system. 
On MCP 18, we have introduced a new utility to configure the TCP IP connections for an MCP system. The System Configure TCP IP utility provides a much simpler interactive experience for configuring TCP IP connections on MCP systems. It comes with default configuration information and helpful text on each screen. You no longer need to memorize the commands to put in an init file or their syntax. The utility can be run from a terminal sessions if you, if you have networking running or from the ODT if you don't. MCP version 3 networking is implemented in both MCP software and in the firmware environment. All of the MCP software required to run v3 networking is included in the MCP 18 release. Availability of the firmware varies from system to system. Any new MCP products that we launch from this point forward, in other words, uh, year 2017 and forward, will come with v3 networking right out of the box. Upgrades will be available for some older systems as well. These systems require a firmware upgrade as well as the MCP 18 system software. Libra 4300, 6300, 8300, and FS600 systems will be upgradable. Since these systems are often installed in complex networking environments, we chose not to make the V3 networking upgrade automatic when you upgrade these systems to MCP 18. To use V3 networking on one of these systems, you will first need to install Firmware Service Pack 1, which has been available on the support site since 2016. And you'll need to update a MIM update package from Unisys support to make the necessary IOP changes for V3. Once these changes are in place, the system will run V3 networking when MCP 18 software is installed. Our currently released software product series products will also be upgradable to V3 networking when we release a firmware upgrade package for them. That firmware upgrade, which covers additional items besides uh, uh, V3 networking, will be available in the second half of 2017. Like the Leaper systems mentioned previously, you will need to install the firmware upgrade and then a MIM update from support to turn on V3 networking. From now on, any new Libra servers, FS servers, and software series products will come with V3 networking regardless of the MCP level installed. No migration is needed on these products to get V3 networking. Older systems that haven't been mentioned above will not support V3 networking. Uh, even when these servers are supported on MCP 18, uh, they will continue to run the older networking because that's what the firmware supports. That's it for the networking changes. Now back to Larry. Okay, thank you, Tim. I'd like to focus on uh, some additional scalability improvements that we're making in MCP 18.0. Um, the comms transaction server has been um, enhanced on MCP 18.0 to expand the number of running programs that it can support. It can now support over 4,095 running programs. This is basically double what it was able to support before. And remote ba database backup has been enhanced uh, to be able to use TCP IP as an alternative to VNA for communication between the two hosts. And this allows it to take advantage of the improved TCP IP performance that Tim just talked about. DBA tools is a set of tools that database administrators can use to monitor and maintain uh, the performance of DMS2, of, uh, DMS2 databases. Uh, the DBA Tools Analyzer product, which is part of the product set, uh, has a new database status check capability that can scan all the recent database snapshots looking for potential limit errors that can cause you some, some headaches. And it has a options to either display the uh, list of limit errors that it finds or provide a report on them. And also the DBA Tools products have been enhanced to have a new user interface with hot links. The next area we want to look at is integration and interoperability. And this includes products that are in, in MCP 18.0 and also some products that are released independently. 
TCP IP has been enhanced in addition to the performance improvements that Tim talked about to uh, support uh, DHCP and DNS. Uh, DHCP, which is a dynamic host configuration protocol, um, enables MCP servers to automatically obtain their IP addresses from a DHCP server. So this makes the administrator's life easier by avoiding to have to, uh, you don't have to configure uh, IP addresses manually anymore. And DNS allows uh, an MCP server's host name and IP address to be published into uh, DNS servers. And this allows uh, other systems to find MCP servers by name as well as by IP address. And the print system uh, has a new LPRIO handler that can send output from MCP system to an LPD print server. Enterprise Output Manager is our primary tool for output management and uh, modernization of output. There's a new Unisys uh, EOM, uh, mobile EOM tool rather, that allows your mobile devices to be able to access and print files uh, that are being managed by EOM. Uh, and this is uh, in the EOM 13.0 release, which is part of MCP 18.0. Another enhancement uh, to EOM 13.0 is uh, integration with enterprise content management uh, products such as Unisys InfoImage. And this enables the ECM solutions to be able to access uh, files that are managed by EOM. EOM also has some security um, improvements. Uh, it can handle do secured file transfers using SSH FTP. It can use TLS to secure communications across sockets and it can create SSL certificates using the SHA-2 algorithms. Prior to EOM 13.0, uh, PDF printing was handled through an add-on. It's now been uh, built into EOM, so you no longer need to uh, configure an add-on to do PDF printing. Uh, the Web Assistant product, which is an add-on uh, to um, EOM, has several new integration and customization facilities. So Web Assistant now has some APIs that allow it to be integrated with applications to make it uh, easier to use. Also, the web pages that end users use to access files managed by EOM that have been published on the web, uh, these files pages can now be customized to suit your business needs. And finally, Web Assistant users can um, select zip and then download multiple files in a single operation. Operation Sentinel is a tool that you can use to manage your data center from a single pane of glass. Uh, Operation Sentinel 16.0 is included with MCP 18.0. Uh, it has the ability to set an SNMP trap uh, to other systems management tools whenever it detects uh, an alert. It also can monitor the newest uh, ePortal products, ePortal Generation 4. Uh, it can monitor them alongside other ClearPath server components. Uh, configuration information can be backed up, uh, restored uh, for DR purposes, and it can also be synchronized uh, if you have redundant uh, Operation Sentinel servers. Similarly, imp uh, alert policies can be imported and exported from uh, Operation Sentinel. Also, Operation Sentinel is uh, now compatible with the latest versions of Windows, Windows 10, and Windows Server 2016. Now I'd like to talk about some of the enhancements to our products uh, that are independently released from, uh, from the MCP. So there's five of them. There's data exchanges, which is for data integration, uh, application integration services for building distributed applications, ePortal, which has uh, been around for a while, which is used to uh, extend the applications to the web. Uh, and then we have some development tools, the ClipEth Visual IDE and the MCP IDE for Eclipse. So on this slide, I've listed the current releases and uh, their release dates. The first product is Data Exchange. It's a relatively new product uh, for data integration. It allows you to take data out of a source database, such as DMS2, uh, transform it, and then replicate it into a target data store, such as SQL Server or Oracle. So the primary uses of this product are to do uh, business process integration using data opposed to applications and messaging. 
and also to be able to acquire data for reporting, uh, BI, or for big data applications. So one of the main benefits of, of data exchange is it allows you to capture changes to a source database in, in real time, transform them, and then put them into a, uh, a target database. And this can be done automatically as the changes are, uh, occur to the source database. Because data exchange will monitor the audit file. So you can use a product like Data Exchange to be able to replace uh, batch data transfers that use things like FTP and similar technologies to move data in a non-real-time fashion. So now you can go from non-real-time to real-time. This can also help you reduce software development costs because you no longer have to maintain the homegrown tools that um, you use to do integration. Data Exchange is a package software product that you can uh, configure to to do what you need with it. It has the ability to share only the data that needs to be shared between the two databases. This helps minimize overhead. And because it works with heterogeneous data stores and operating systems, it can help increase your IT flexibility. This slide summarizes the key features of data exchange. Uh, the features that were introduced in the recent 4.0 release are in red. So if you have a DMS2 database that's a source, you can uh, transform and propagate data into SQL Server as well as Oracle. And uh, we have the ability to do round trip data transfers between SQL Server and back to, back to DMS2. Now when, it, when you get around to doing the actual transforms, there's two types of transforms. There's bulk data transforms that are for historical data. So this you might use run once when you first integrate the databases to uh, transform and propagate the historical data. Then you could turn on a change data transformation that will run in real time and capture changes to the occur because of, uh, as they occur because it monitors the audit file. Now, Data Exchange has some common transformation functions built into the product, but many users want to be able to customize the transformations. So on 4.0, we introduced the ability to define, uh, for users to define their own transformation functions. The data, data exchange will use uh, when transforming the data. And to help you avoid propagating unneeded data, uh, data exchange has some filters where you can define the criteria to be used when uh, determining whether or not to propagate uh, certain data. And finally, um, you can uh, specify data manipulation uh, language command substitution uh, at the target database so that the uh, command that's used there is not necessarily the same one that was used at the, uh, at the source database. Uh, application Integration Services is a relatively new product that's been designed to make cross-platform development easier. And it does this because it provided some value-added uh, extensions uh, that can't be provided by standards-based integration technologies. So its primary use case is to integrate distributed applications uh, that have to uh, leverage resources from, let's say, MCP and Windows.net, or MCP and, uh, and Java. So it can help you reduce the cost of, distributing, of building distributed applications uh, because it, it can basically reduce the amount of code that you have to write to have an application, let's say, running on Windows to maybe access a comms transaction, or maybe to have a Java application read an MCP file. It does a lot of work that you no longer have to code in your application. And it provides some capabilities that, you can, that can't be provided by a standards-based product. So for example, it allows Windows applications to access all the MCP file attributes. Well, standards-based product isn't going to be able to do that because it doesn't have a way to uh, represent um, MCP file attributes in a standard way so that they can be uh, replicated uh, elsewhere, whereas a product like Data Exchange, which was built specifically to integrate Windows and MCP, can do that. Another goal of this product is to give you more flexibility for Java applications. Um, it allows you to run, the, run Java applications on the hardware of your choice and not on a fixed function J processor, and then use AIS to uh, allow the Java application to, to uh, access MCP resources. This also gives you a choice of Java virtual machines and Java application servers. So here's what you can do with AIS. Uh, when you're integrating .NET with the MCP, 
your .NET applications can access MCP files. They can call libraries on the MCP that are written in COBOL 85, ALGOL, and NOOP, and they can initiate comms transactions. If you need to integrate Java with the MCP environment, a Java application running on a JVM on Windows can use AIS to access MCP files to call libraries written in ALGOL. AIS also allows MCP applications that are written in ALGOL or COBOL 85 to be able to call into Java applications. Uh, 4.0 is the uh, latest release of AIS. It's uh, in the process of being uh, released uh, this week or next. And the file access capability for .NET applications has been enhanced uh, so that .NET applications can access COBOL 85 uh, file records by individual fields rather than having to access the entire record as a, as a single string. And the service that allows .NET applications to do library calls uh, into COBOL 85 programs has been enhanced uh, to be able to handle uh, uh, data records that have the COBOL 85 filler clause. Uh, connections can be established uh, automatically uh, by applications using the AS. And for our users in Japan, AIS supports uh, Gaji, so you can freely use uh, locally defined glyphs uh, in uh, applications that use AIS. ePortal is our, our solution that you can use to uh, extend the clear path applications to the web, to mobile devices, and to SOA environments using web services. Uh, release 7.1 is the current release of ePortal software, and it has some enhancements to make it easier to support um, apps that are designed to work on multiple devices, such as uh, iOS from Apple, Android, and on Windows. And it does this by supporting the Apache Cordova uh, SDK tools and community plugins, and it supports release 6.3.0 of uh, Cordova. Uh, to help applications uh, you know, uh, uh, to provide a high availability uh, environment for ePortal applications, uh, ePortal supports two types of uh, redundant backend uh, application configurations. Uh, you can have a load balance configuration where the load gets spread across multiple uh, servers, and then you can configure an active standby configuration where you've got one server that's that's active, and then you have a standard uh, a standby server that's inactive, and then it fails over if the active server uh, goes down. Uh, so for supporting DevOps and automation, uh, you can automate several operations uh, in ePortal, so several administrative operations, using web services interfaces and tools such as PowerShell. So you can, you can automate application building, staging, and development activities, managing uh, web partition cluster memberships, and also the status of a web partition. Some additional enhancements are a new entry-level ePortal business platform. There's been some log management improvements, as well as some management and diagnostic enhancements. ClearPath Visual IDE is a relatively new product that runs on a Windows workstation that enables developers to use Microsoft Visual Studio to develop MCP applications. Uh, it's implemented as a plug-in to Microsoft Visual Studio. And the primary benefit of this product is to um, help reduce the cost of bringing new MCP developers on board. There's a lot of people out there in the industry that have experience with Visual Studio, and we think that uh, being able to use it to develop MCP applications can help reduce the amount of um, training that a new developer uh, who has with the MCP environment uh, reduce the amount of training that they need to become productive. Another area where this can help you is if you have to build a, an application that has uh, a component running on the MCP and a second component running on Windows, now you can use a single tool to, to develop most both parts of the application. And we think this can help improve the productivity of the developers who have to develop that type of application. 
the one to, to release is the current release of uh, Visual IDE, and it has the ability to use to allow you to use Visual Studio to edit and build uh, MCB COBOL 74, COBOL 85, and COBOL, uh, Elgol and NUP applications. It supports uh, the commonly available syntax highlighting capability. You can run the application from Visual Studio. You can also initiate debugging using TADS for Visual Studio. It uses Visual Studio source control capabilities. Uh, it has MCB style patching. And you can use the Visual IDE with Visual Studio 2013 and 2015. Another development tool that um, is, is focused on um, making new MCP developers productive is, is our ClearPath MCP IDE for Eclipse. So this is targeted at developers who have experience using Eclipse, which is very popular in the Java environment. Uh, it's been around for several years. It's, it's more mature than the Visual, I, uh, Visual IDE product. And so right now we're focusing on uh, new features that, that you're requesting. So for productivity, we have some uh, file transfer um, improvements uh, to make it easier to monitor the status of, of NFT and FTP file transfers and also be able to shut them down directly from inside of Eclipse. And then you can uh, view printer, printer backup files from inside of Eclipse uh, more easily than you could before. Uh, for DevOps support, uh, you can build MCP products using Jenkins, Subversion, and uh, command line build capability. Uh, the current release supports um, source control using Git as a new capability. And it's compatible with, with both Windows 10 and Eclipse 4.5. Now that we've completed um, talking about all the new features in the MCP 18.0 release and uh, some independent releases, I'd like to give you a bit of information about where you can get more, info, more uh, details about these uh, new products and new features. The first is the, our documentation library uh, that contains all the technical documents. Uh, this is planned to be available on our support website by the end of the week. Uh, and uh, no login is required to, uh, to access that library. And of course, for all the independent releases that I just talked about, that documentation is currently on the support website. Now, one change we're making for uh, MCP 18.0 is we're no longer going to have a physical documentation CD that we uh, distribute uh, when you get your uh, software update for MCP 18.0. Um, you'll, you'll go to the support website to get all the documentation that you need. And uh, in addition to the individual documents, there'll be a zip file out there if you just want to download everything in one download and then be able to use the, um, the products, uh, the documents at, at your leisure. Something new that we've done for uh, MCP 18.0 is we've had engineering record a technical update. And this is a series of 16 technical videos where they've basically taken presentations and recorded the um, narration of the presentation uh, for YouTube. And we've posted them all on YouTube on the ClearPath, um, uh, Unisys uh, ClearPath channel uh, on YouTube. So this is the first time we've done this, and we'd like some, if you have a chance to use these, maybe you get bored watching the NBA playoffs or the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs. You want to take a look at some of these. We'd like some feedback on them to see you know, if they're useful to you. Uh, what can we do to make them? more useful uh, in future releases. So these are out there now on YouTube. Unisys.com has a, uh, some additional resources. It has our, our newsletters, both the ClearPath Connection, and if you use Agile Business Suite, there's the Developing the Agility newsletter. There are also some additional uh, resources, uh, executive briefs, some eBooks, as well as the recordings of all of our past webcasts on Unisys.com. On Unisys.com, we also have some information on our ClearPath Forward services, which uh, are designed to make it uh, easier for you to take advantage of the benefits in our ClearPath uh, Forward products. And finally, we have ClearPath Forward on social media, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, there's also a, uh, a discussion group and a, a blog on Unisys.com. 
And uh, we have the link here to the uh, Clear Breath Forward YouTube channel. So this brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, one thing I've been asked to uh, mention to you is that there's going to be another webcast uh, on May 24th, which is four weeks from today, where we're going to be talking about uh, the latest technology developments on our Libra server line. And so there's some exciting new developments that we'd like to tell you about. Um, if you're subscribed to get, e get emails like you did an invite for this uh, webcast, you'll get an, an invite for the May 24th webcast uh, uh, sometime in the coming days. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, I'm sure you're all very busy, and i um, like to wish you a good day. So Matt, do we have any questions that um, need to be answered? Um, looks uh, like we had a few come across here, but I think with all the resources that uh, you just shared with us, that's probably why we didn't have more. Um, we can uh, go ahead and get started with uh, the first one that we did have come across, though, and that is, how does the database encryption interact with or complement the disk encryption currently available? They're, they're separate products. Uh, disk encryption encrypts the entire volume. Um, database encryption is, is designed to um, allow you to encrypt individual data items within the database. So they, they, the, the scope of them is very different. Um, another difference between the products is that database encryption um, encrypts the, the data, not just in the database, um, it's encrypted in memory, it's encrypted in memory dumps, in audit files. Um, so let's say if somebody has a, a rogue program that goes out and tries to read a database file, um, it will um, just get encrypted data because it's not going to, there's going to be nobody to uh, decrypt the data, whereas it tries to read the file on an encrypted disk, it's just another program, and it's going to see the data in clear uh, clear text. Uh, Kung may have some additional details to offer in that area, or we want to clarify some of the comments that I just made. Yeah, thank you, Larry. What you said are all correct. Uh, basically, the difference is like uh, uh, for the database encryption, the data are all protected even in the memory. The only time the data will be decrypted is when we transfer the data from the Unisys software to the user program. And user program always see the clear text anyway, because that's where we start with. And that's a big difference. This encryption is whenever you do an I.O., you do a write, it will be encryption. When you do a read, the data will be decrypted. No memory protection. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Yes. And um, the next uh, question that we have for you is, how does DMS2 encryption work with products like DataBridge? But right now, uh, we've not integrated either Data Exchange or Data Bridge with um, database encryption. That's something that um, we're looking for some feedback from from customers in terms of what what's needed in that area um, and, uh, to satisfy specific requirements uh, to help us define you know, how, how to do it for those products. It's, it's, when we're doing interoperability with other products, it's it's not a as straightforward as when we just have you know, a DMS2 database that's encrypted. So if we're going to be, let's say, interoperating with SQL or Oracle, that can become a much more complex uh, activity. So we're looking for some, some feedback from clients about what types of uh, encryption integration this is needed um, between those those uh, ETL products and, and uh, DMS2. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. The last question I have for you is, does BNA over TCP eliminate protocol 49? Tim, can you answer that? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't have a good answer for it. We'll follow All up right. afterwards. We can, we can definitely take that one uh, offline. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you, Larry, for any closing statements that you have that does wrap up Q&A for us today. Okay, thank you, Matt. 
I'd like to thank all of you again for taking time out of your busy day to attend this uh, webinar on ClearPath MCP 18.0. Um, I'd like to encourage you to look at the um, uh, videos that engineering has recorded that we've placed on YouTube where you can get more information about the uh, features of MCP 18.0. We'd like your feedback on those videos. Uh, do, are they helpful? Do we need to make some changes to make them more useful? Uh, that sort of thing. I also want to remind you again that um, four weeks from today, on May 24th, there will be another webinar to discuss the latest developments in the Libra server technology. And if you're on our distribution list for um, email invites, you'll get an, e an invite for that over sometime in the next week or so. So again, thank you for attending today.